From UFOs to psychic powers and government conspiracies, history is riddled with unexplained events. You can turn back now or learn the stuff they don't want you to know. A production of iHeartRadio. Hello, welcome back to the show. My name is Matt. My name is Noel. They call me Ben. We are joined, as always, with our super producer, Paul Mission Control Deccant. Most importantly, you are you, you are here, and that makes this the stuff they don't want you to know. This week, we are focusing on a couple of issues related to the conflict between Ukraine and NATO, aka the Global West, and Russia. Uh, we're probably going to do some more episodes about this. As you know, fellow conspiracy realist, uh, we don't always, uh, we're not always super eager to cover ongoing events because no one yet, not even DARPA, can predict the future. But what we can do, what we must do, is dive into the context behind this conflict. It's crucial, it's crazy, and in some cases, it's very, very much the stuff they don't want you to know. So the story starts way before the current conflict. It starts way before the 2014 annexation or retaking of Crimea. Uh, here are the facts. Uh, first thing, I, I, I think we can say it because we're based in, in the U.S., until fairly recently, until like 2014 in March, a lot of people in the U.S. would not have been able to reliably point out Ukraine on a map. And that's not that's not a ding on any resident of the U.S. It's just it's there are a lot of countries and they, they would have known that Ukraine was in Europe, but they would have, you know, if they had a blank map, they would have maybe had a tough time figuring out which one was Ukraine. I mean, I think a lot of people probably embarrassingly mistake Ukrainians for Russians sometimes. Their written language looks similar. There's a similarity in the accent, but I have a feeling that is going to become a very unpopular mistake to make. <laughs> yeah, you know, I know when you say that for a second, I had deja vu and then I can't remember if we had a very similar, <laughs> similarly accurate conversation. Several years ago in 2014, it's you're you're absolutely right. And they share, as we'll find, um, a very close, very connected cultural history with several other modern day countries in the area. I mean, it is a shame that the country was so unfamiliar to so many Americans, because if you just look at the facts, Ukraine is has been and will remain to be a resource giant. I learned so many weird trade facts about Ukraine over the past three weeks or so, just looking into looking into stuff, looking past the headlines. Yeah, I think we all have. <laughs> yeah, for sure. And, and that would make them sort of like a powerhouse in and of themselves, you know, in terms of imports and exports and, you know, being a global citizen in terms of the economy, correct? Yes, sir. Everything from uranium to titanium, from shale gas reserves to barley and wheat. They're also a transit country for a lot of Western Europe's energy resources. And not for nothing was Ukraine uh, often called the breadbasket of the Soviet Union or the breadbasket of uh, Russia or Europe even. I mean, Oh, okay, the B thing, I don't know why that surprises me. I, I put in a list of all these exports that Ukraine has, but they are the fifth biggest B producer in the world. Who would have thought that? I mean, a lot of not, people not in Ukraine I. are like, yeah, <laughs> but I don't think the three of us knew. In terms of like honeybees, like for, you know, that kind of thing? Just bees, man. Just, just I, I assume honeybees and not carpenter bees. But I do yeah, love the idea. I mean, you that, know, people that yeah. are setting up bee farms, they need like stock to start with, right? And then right. sometimes you want you want to get the good bees. So I guess that's where Ukraine comes in. I just love the idea that somewhere out there in uh, in Eastern Europe, there's a business tycoon, a business tycoon, and ah. <laughs> people are like, I know, sorry, and people are like, hey, what what do you do for a living? He's like, I'm into bees, and he's telling the truth, or she. So. This place isn't just a resource giant. It is also a very ancient land. If you look back to the earliest traces of human habitation, we're talking tens of thousands of years ago. Uh, if you lived in Europe from like the 9th to 11th century, uh, uh, 
CE, that is, you would see that a place, an empire called Kievan Rus would have been the largest empire in your part of the world if you were in Eastern Europe. And this would have been well before it was part of the Soviet Union or like ruled by a czar from from Moscow, correct? Correct. Way, way, yeah. way before. Way, way, way before. Way before. <laughs> we're talking about ni- 980 to 1015. Yeah. Kind of that's that's kind of a golden age of Kiev or of Kievan Rus. Um, today, if you look at the modern cultures that sprang from this empire, Belarus, Russia, Ukraine, they all claim ancestry from that empire. And it makes sense. I mean, in Belarus and Russia, it's in the name. They just went with that name. <laughs> and uh, yep. it, yeah, and it's fair to say that right now, Propaganda aside, right now, Ukraine, which is a democracy, is overwhelmingly in favor of remaining an independent, sovereign state. But it's important to note the population is not monolithic. There there are a lot of people in the eastern area of Ukraine that speak Russian. They're ethnically Russian. There may be. Some of them are not necessarily opposed to Russia becoming once again a hegemonic force and them functioning as like a vassal or client state. But that's not the majority of Ukrainian opinion. I'm going to recommend a video everybody watch after you listen to this episode. It's from Gravitas Plus. It's titled Explained the Russia-Ukraine Crisis. It goes over a map that shows exactly where on that eastern side of Ukraine, where the Russian-speaking populations are that would probably be more likely to want intervention from Russia. Uh, And it is a very, like, small relative chunk, right, compared to the rest of Ukraine, as you're saying, Ben. There's also a documentary that um, I have not gotten to yet, but I I plan to. It's called Winter on Fire, Ukraine's Fight for Freedom, that really goes very deep into all of these uh, specific kind of cultural differences and the history of Ukraine and its relationship with, uh, with Russia. Mm -hmm. which is complicated and fraught, Uh, but it is important context here. And, you know, obviously when we're saying there are um, Russian speaking areas of the country where some people might be more in support of the Russian perspective in this conflict, that is by no means us saying that the entirety of that region is in support. There is an open invasion, a conflict, a war, Um, but Russian historians have a very different idea of how the present state of affairs came to be and a bit of a different narrative of how uh, how we got there. So they consider Kievan Rus to be like the first period of Russian history. So while that modern conflict or this modern conflict may seem to have relatively recent beginnings to many outsiders, it is mission critical to understand that the makings of this current situation date far back into antiquity. And we're talking about Russian historians as in, you know, academics that specialize in the history of Russia, not necessarily historians from Russia who may have a very different view of this, Mm, who are like government sanctioned. And in terms of the line, you know, the party line, uh, we know how that narrative can be manipulated and uh, made uh, into propaganda. Yeah, but we, we do have to acknowledge Kivian roots uh, from which these modern cultures sprang. And when we're talking about history, a lot of times when you're hearing some policy wonk or boffin talk about uh, historical context for this conflict, they're going to be talking about the USSR. Because to understand what's happening in Ukraine and in eastern Ukraine and Crimea, we have to get past the headlines to the story of the Soviet Union for many, many years. Ukraine was part of the USSR, it was a Soviet republic, and it remained so all the way up to the dissolution or the fall of the USSR and the Soviet Union in 1991. Uh, Up until that time, Ukraine was the number two kid on the block, (laughs) BLOC block. So it was Eastern uh, block, right? Yeah, all right. Yeah, it was uh, the second most powerful republic, and the other one, you know, the number one was Russia, which at, at that time was also a republic. What did it mean to be a vassal state in that arrangement? Like, you know, it was all kind of controlled from this hegemonic government in Moscow, and everyone sort of was beholden to that regime. Uh, were they trying to wipe out? individual cultural differences and make it more unified or what, what, what would it have felt like 
to, to live in the USSR in Ukraine at that time? Yeah, so that's a good question. So a vassal state in general terms is going to be a state or a republic or whatever you want to call it that has uh, some degree of independence in its internal affairs. But when it comes to its foreign affairs, that's when the that uh, another state controls it, basically. So like Ukraine may be able to make laws that apply to its its own borders or within its own sphere as a Soviet Republic. But then when it came to like, who's going to wage war with, uh, you know, the Yankees, then that's kind of a, a Moscow decision. So Ukraine achieved independence very quickly after the dissolution of the USSR in 1991 in a referendum where over 80 percent um, in every region except for Crimea uh, voted for this. Uh, in Crimea, it was 55 percent um, that voted for independence from the USSR. Yes. And what did the USSR have, uh, as well as the United States and several other countries? Nukes. Lots mm -hmm. and lots of nukes. And Ukraine actually kind of had a lot of the nukes, probably strategically because of how close they were to the rest of Europe and other places that, you know, <laughs> the Soviet Union would have wanted to attack if they had to. Uh, Ukraine, just give you a couple of these numbers here. They had 176 intercontinental ballistic missiles, 1,200, over 1,200 nuclear warheads, 44 strategic bombers, 700 nuclear tipped cruise missiles, 2,000 tactical nuclear missiles, uh, lots and lots and lots of fissile material. Yeah, they had the toy box for sure. And it's weird because they only had that for a few short years after their independence. In fact, Russia and the United States teamed up. They worked together to denuclearize Ukraine with a series of diplomatic agreements. So what happened is Kiev gave back, you know, gave Russia its nuclear warheads in exchange for a security treaty or a security agreement where Russia said, OK, we'll take the guns. But don't worry, we got your back if anybody comes comes at you sideways. And we also won't come at you over you wanting independence. So it was kind of a quid pro quo situation. Uh, I mean, a lot well, of people say I mean, a lot of things. Okay. Okay. I mean, it, <laughs> hey, it took a while. You know, it took a while for them to come at them over it. I mean, I'm sure they weren't happy about it. But at least they got their nukes back. That's a pretty big flex. You declare independence and have this referendum, and then you're still holding on to Mother Russia's nukes. It's a pretty good bargaining chip. Right. And at the at the time, um, at, at the time, Ukraine did not have the ability to control those nukes. It's a it's a weird situation like Russia would be able to launch them. But they were, you know, as as you guys point out, due to strategic concerns, they were located in Ukraine. But yes, they did give them back. And unlike several other countries who stepped back from becoming a nuclear state, uh, Ukraine was not uh, immediately demolished by the U.S. Those are just facts. But uh, let's look at Vladimir Putin, you've heard, or Vladimir, as I think it would be called in Ukraine. Um, you've heard a lot of heard a lot of stuff trying to like read into the mind of one person, one very powerful, dangerous person. If we stick to the facts, we know that before he became the longtime leader of post-Soviet Russia, Putin was a KGB officer earlier in his career. And a lot has been made about his experience there. And yes, he was in the trade. He was, he was doing espionage and spy work and intelligence work. Um, but he also carried with him, this is inarguable because he said it himself, um, he and many in his inner circle, often from that time, have long held several ironclad beliefs. The one you're going to hear most often in the West is the post-Soviet stance of Russia, and it's a very firm stance, it's a red line for them, that no matter what, not once, not never, can Ukraine join something called the North Atlantic Treaty Organization or NATO? Not to be confused with the Japanese fermented soybean NATO, which tastes like diaper smell. I said it. Uh, that's what I've heard. Mm. How can they enforce that? It's just like part of the agreement uh, for their independence or obviously, is it just more of a decorum nope. thing? This no. is a belief that is held by Vladimir Putin and many of his inner circle. Like, this cannot happen. This cannot stand. It will not happen. We'll do we'll whatever it takes from to keep it from happening. I got it. Yeah. Um, so let's, let's talk about NATO really quickly. Uh, many of us know what it is. 
It was an, it's an organization that was formed back in 1949. Why 1949? Because it was following World War II. It's an intergovernmental military alliance, an alliance of individual governments and countries. They, they basically got together after the war and said, hey, if you mess with one of these countries, boop, 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 wherever it is in the world, you're messing with all of us. So don't. Cool. Uh, that's really what NATO is. <laughs> Yeah, we roll deep. Uh, It's currently made of 28 European... We roll deep says NATO. Stuff they don't want you to know is not technically a signatory member of NATO. We're a podcast. And I don't know if they take podcasts yet. But uh, so right now, there are 28 European countries and then Canada and the US. That, That is NATO. And there are ally countries or countries who are friendly with NATO and usually move in step with them when their interests align. Because again, countries do not have friends. They have interests. So you'll see Japan doing things in concert with NATO, for instance. The thing is, Russia is, how to say, not super gassed about the idea. They don't love it. They don't love this whole NATO thing. It's not their vibe. Uh, And they especially don't love it when former states from the Soviet Union end up joining. NATO, in Russia's perspective, is an expansionist threat. There's not new information by any means. They weren't shamalaning people when they said, we don't like NATO, don't get into our sphere of influence. Uh, But that's still only part of the equation. So anyone, if you remember our earlier episode on 2014, on the annexation of Crimea that March, it's clear that Russia and the West, again, have two very different versions of history and two very different takes on what the future of Ukraine and the entirety of Eastern Europe should be. This conflict, what we're saying is this conflict was a long time in coming, and there is a much bigger game at play. We're talking, you know, we're cry havoc. Let's slip the dogs of war. Unfortunately, um, a lot of a lot of Americans uh, might believe that the war began just a few days ago in February of 2022. You know, there was a lot of there's a lot of scuttlebutt where people are saying, well, why are they just why aren't they calling it an invasion? Why aren't and now why aren't they calling it a war, et cetera, et cetera. But that belief is uh, well-intentioned, but incorrect. Other people might say, nope. The war actually started back in 2014. And this likewise is not in entirely accurate. But for the record, if you ask a, a citizen of Ukraine how long they've been at war with Russia, over 70 percent are going to say since Crimea, if, if not before. That would have been more of a Cold War. Uh, the what the stuff before, yeah, well, economic tensions, threats, kind of stuff. But Crimea is when the tank treads hit the road, basically. So the retaking or annexation, we'll explain what we mean there, uh, of Crimea was most likely sparked by the ousting of the president at the time, a guy named Viktor Yanukovych. Viktor Yanukovych is very pro Moscow. And when NATO and the global West were making overtures toward him, uh, Moscow was making these overtures as well, and he went closer to Moscow. And this was, uh, for many people in Ukraine, this was controversial. And they felt, in fact, that he might have been selling out the country to Russia. Well, there was a trade deal with the European yeah. European Union that was on the table that he rejected, and he ended up taking a fifteen billion dollar bailout, essentially from mm-hmm. Russia. Exactly. And that that's when stuff started going bad uh, from a citizen's perspective. When you saw protests, and uh, the he ended up having to leave. In terms of making Ukraine more beholden to Russia, and the citizens did not care for that. Right. Yeah, that was I mean, because keep in mind, at this time, there were still people alive who remembered quite well the days of the USSR. And additionally, and they remember several other tensions, conflicts, um, less than good things, things that Orwell would call double plus ungood. Anyway, 1984. But uh, so this is this is why it's fair to say that Russia's government including, of course, Vladimir Putin, saw the taking of Crimea less, and, and, and you know, the, what's going on in the eastern regions today, less as a invasion and more as a return to their equivalent of the good old days, the days of empire. Uh, another thing we point out 
in our Crimea episode is that Ukraine only officially counted Crimea as part of its land in 1954 when Nikita Khrushchev gifted the land to Ukraine. And he did this partially out of sentimentality, most likely, and then partially as a powerful flex. Look what I can do. And it kind of uh, gave him his stripes in some ways to do some other bigger things later down the line. But to understand what this war is, where it came from, and what the forces involved would like to see in terms of outcome, we have to look at something the West has been pretty shy about exploring in an accurate way, and that is the Russian perspective. So I propose we pause for a word from our sponsors, check the news before we continue, and then dive in. Or not, or not. Just never check the news again and just yeah. be happy until, you, yeah, you know De- what happens. Definitely don't check your E-Trade account because that's going to be very sad too. <laughs> Here's where it gets crazy. This is a long, long, long time in the making. Russian media, as well as its political power structure, offer repeated multiple instances of ideological, nationalistic, or cultural rationalizations for gaining control of part of or all of Ukraine. And we can discuss those, but we also need to note again that ideology almost always functions as window dressing for the real cause of most conflicts. And the real cause of most conflicts, it goes down to stuff like access to land, access to security, access to resources. Yeah, otherwise, why take the gamble? You know, uh, I'm sure we'll get into it soon, but it seems like there's some very serious consequences for what Putin is doing. So one would think that his reasons for going in outweigh the potential, you know, ramifications of all these sanctions on, you know, the economy of his country. Yeah, it depends what the end goals are, and uh, that's what we're trying to explore, right? So Mm -hmm. uh, let's talk about some of the tools that Russia has in its belt there when it comes to uh, what it can do to really flex on the rest of the world as it's taking these kinds of actions and seeing such pushback. The first one is one that I did not realize until, I don't know, couple of weeks ago, and, and Ben Noel, we had some conversations about this, but just how important Russia is to the world's supply of petroleum and gasoline. Oh, yeah. I, had, I just had no idea. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's one of the uh, one of their biggest flexes. So they control a huge chunk of the fossil fuel energy upon which Western Europe is dependent. Uh, another tool in the belt They have, of course, a vast stock of nuclear weapons, and not just a vast stock of nuclear weapons, but also uh, they have the know-how and the infrastructure to deploy those in some tremendously successful ways, in theory. And we're talking about the sub-game at that point, which is sharp. Remember the list of, you know, (laughs) nuclear gadgets that Matt rattled off early in the episode. I mean... You know, uh, what would the Joker say? You know, uh, where does he where does he get these toys or whatever? I mean, they've got like a ton of different things that do different things, all with one tragic and apocalyptic result. And uh, kind of to your point there, Ben, remember that these weapons that were traded back to Russia in 1993 were being developed from, you know, the jump of nuclear technology uh, up until that point, And, you know, more. Well, again, when you think about there's no way to prove if more weapons were, in fact, produced in that amount of time or how many. I don't think I don't think there is intel on exactly how many types of nukes were developed or at hand right now uh, since that time, since the, the large amount was traded. But the as you said, the sub game is strong and those subs carry nuclear armaments. They very much do. They very much do. And subs are tricky or Trixie, as Gollum would say. Uh, but that's not all. Uh, up, until, up until a few years back, one of the common arguments you would hear from Cold War hawks was that Russia's third tremendous power was their military might. And now seeing what's, what's been happening in Ukraine um, and seeing the way deployment has worked out for them, uh People are increasingly skeptical about that idea of a great unstoppable military force. Anyway, 
in concert with those powers, Russia also has clear needs, both from a domestic perspective and from a geopolitical perspective. A lot of the land, until climate change escalates past a certain threshold, opening up you know, more arable land and opening up northern trade routes right around the poles, uh, much of the land of Russia is unfailingly, cartoonishly, take a drink, inhospitable. Uh, for the military to effectively project like <laughs> maritime or naval force, they need warm water ports. They've been after warm water ports for a long, long time. It's a perfect, perfectly rational ambition because warm water ports are just, they what they sound like. They're ports that don't freeze up and become unusable for much of the year. Secondly, we have to look at what, so we know what capabilities are there in just in very broad strokes. We know some of the very broad needs, but we also have to ask ourselves about the reasoning, the rationale. Propaganda aside, it's in the world of geopolitics, it's pretty rare for someone not to behave as a rational actor. What we mean by that is even if you do not agree with the aims of arrival, you should be able to suss out their calculus, the equations, the, the cost benefit they went through to arrive at their stance. And the Russian government, seen most blatantly in the statements in action by Putin, does seem to yearn to restore as much of the former Russian empire as possible. And while those tactics might change, the aim is clear. I remember off, because uh, we've talked about this for a while, off air on our fascinating group thread, I had texted you guys and I just said, beat me here, Paul. I said, did you guys catch Putin's speech? It's lit. <laughs> <And that's laughs> yeah. mm -hmm. It's been interesting watching the, the drips and drabs of his rhetoric that have leaked out, um, you know, through Russian national television and all that that we're seeing over here on the news. Uh, he, he does a really interesting thing where he's seated like 100 feet or more away from his cabinet, I guess you could call it. And he doesn't really take any guff. Like there's a, a clip that's been making the rounds where I forget who it was, one of his ministers or whatever, um, essentially is saying like, maybe we should uh, give diplomacy a chance, uh, you know, more or less. And he just kind of browbeats the guy and uh, essentially, you know, heckles him until he just reverses course entirely. But I just think the distance is really interesting between Putin and like in all of these spaces. He's at the head of this giant boardroom table. And again, like 100 feet between him and and uh, and his, you know, his his, his officials. Um, I, I have a theory uh, that maybe I'll get into a little later in the next episode about why that he might likes be, but big it's tables. very odd. And yeah, that speech was that speech and was I think absolutely lit. I like lie. big tables and I cannot lie. <laughs> oh, sorry. He oh. can't lie. Uh, or he lies so, all the time. Yeah. Uh, you know, the I said a hundred feet from my allies. <laughs> no other sorry. vessels okay. can deny. Uh, <laughs> right. Uh, <laughs> oh, the lyrics will be worth writing. Maybe we'll get on that. But the uh yes, so it is true uh that you can you can see these speeches uh until hackers took down some infra online infrastructure from Russia. You could also see a lot of Kremlin official translations of these speeches into English, as well as essays that he had written. What we're saying is this didn't come out of nowhere. He's been thinking about it for a long, long time. Uh, also, Noel, I believe the clip you're mentioning, I first saw it on the excellent last week tonight with uh, John Oliver. Yeah, uh, so you can check that out for free online if you want to get a sense of it. And it is uncomfortable <laughs> what's, what's happening. Uh, it's not to mention that the other people that are seated are like fidgeting the whole time and just clearly <laughs> yeah. terrified of the man, you know, and not. Uh, I mean, I guess you could call them sycophants, but also like what choice do they have? Uh, I, I don't know. I'm not trying to like, um, you know, empathize with them too hard because they are in a position that requires them to be sycophants. But then if they leave, who knows what happens then? I mean, it just seems like a real catch-22 for some of those folks. But there's a lot of seat squirming mm -hmm. oh, and, and we should we should mention, I don't think I mentioned this before, uh, that clip specifically is about supporting the independence, the proclaimed independence of these two areas that are located in a part of eastern Ukraine called Donbass. And those are Donetsk and Luhansk. Uh, so the... <laughs> I'm just remembering that clip. So uh, how, how do we know this long time in coming or this idea of expansionist, this idea of um, recovering, resurrecting in some part the Russian empire? Well, 
It's uh, something we've talked about in the past a little bit. In 2008, Russia did something very similar where they attempted to take not the entirety of a country, but some pieces. Well, it's it's ridiculously similar to the current situation in Ukraine, where there are sections of a country that do want to be a part of Russia again, or at least they cl- there are strong voices and numbers of people who proclaim to want to be a part of Russia again and no longer a part of the country that they currently are, in this case, Georgia. And then Russia just really, really supports that, like really strongly. Like, yeah, that's a great idea. Uh, you should be a part I of wish Russia. We would have thought of that. <laughs> well, oh wait. <laughs> well, but then there's conflict between the country and you know the section that wants to pull away, uh, and Russia supports that side that wants to pull away mm-hmm. with military might. And then there's some fighting and shelling that occurs on the borders of those regions. Those and are then, what you'd call separatists. Yeah, correct? Separatist secessionists. Mm-hmm. And then Russia comes in with that military might, and then it ends up becoming a bat, like a full on, a full scale. I, I don't know what you call it, Ben, a, a police action, a war. A, it's the thing that's just under war, basically. But oh, it Russia looks loves, a lot uh, like a war. Military operation. But yes, but in this case, yes. But in this case, I, I yeah, believe Georgia I believe did declare right. war uh, mm-hmm. when it was occurring. This is showing us that, that a playbook of some sort exists. And it's something that we talked a little bit about in previous episodes. Does Russia have a new Rasputin? Do check that out. Uh, We'll also see something here that doesn't get acknowledged as much because a lot of countries use it, which is, and it is a tactic that in all fairness, the U.S. has deployed in Latin America in the past, which is you surreptitiously train and supply people that you are going to send in to accomplish your goals, and then you pretend that they are independent freedom fighters, right? And you just you just get kind of loose and goosey and matrix dodgy when people ask you what you mean by freedom, right? Like, what are they fighting for? So that situation, um, that, that situation is out of the Russian playbook in the Putin era, definitely. Uh, and you'll also see that there is little hesitation in the in the Russian government, increasingly less hesitation at deploying any means necessary, all but one so far. And hopefully that's still the case when this episode comes out. And you will recognize, as we were talking about NATO, the concept of you attack one of us, we will use every means necessary to defend that one country. It's what you're saying. Russia will do the same thing. Uh, we will we will do everything we can to this is exactly what they said during the Georgian conflict. We'll do everything we can to support those who wish to separate from Georgia. Maybe this is a silly question, but just like for some housekeeping, what are the criteria for becoming a member of NATO? Surely it's about mutual um, goals, you know, mutual priorities and also the ability to come to the aid of other member nations. Um, well, it's otherwise, bureaucracy, what's the point? so. <laughs> things kind of by design take a long take a long time so if you want to if you want to join you have to first kind of pretty much declare that you're into the idea like hey i'm interested in joining nato and then if you want to join you enter in a kind of evaluation period you have to meet some political economic and military standards so you have to uphold democracy you got to get some human rights stuff uh, squared away, you know, tolerating diversity. You have to be, this is the neoliberal aspect. You have to be making progress toward a market economy. You got to let those Western banks in. You know what I mean? They want their cut. We'll talk about that later this week. And then, <laughs> I don't know why that sounded like a messed up children's show. But yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, Ben, correct me if I'm wrong, because the last thing you got, the last thing that has to happen is you have to be voted in, right? So standing members have to say, yes, you may join. Do you have to have a sponsor, like joining a fraternity or something? Like, like, like uh, someone like puts forth their buddy nation to like join NATO, or is it all just about like literally submitting, you know, uh, a request? Or you know, like, I mean, it really does have this very like club kind of frat vibe to me. It is a club. It's 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 a big club. Uh, you have to essentially when you you express this desire and then you apply for a NATO membership action plan, which is when they say, okay, let's check the democracy. Let's check the human rights. Let's make sure 
You have a market economy. Um, the civilian forces must be in ultimate control of the military. You've got to not be waging wars. Uh, you have to be a good neighbor, you know, not make wars on adjacent countries, uh, much less NATO members. Yeah. State farm vibes, you know? Yeah, exactly. And uh, this Ukraine had in the past expressed a desire to join NATO, but had not been formally admitted. And that, again, would have been a red line. Russia would have treated that as a declaration of war from everything they've indicated. And you'll you'll see all this, um, a lot of guessing, a lot of tea leaf reading uh, of as to Putin's personal motivations. And we are in an extraordinary situation because there is one person at the helm of Russia's geopolitical decision making right now, quite honestly. And that's somewhat rare, you know, in in the U.S., for example, or in the I don't know, the United Kingdom and many, many other countries. It's not just one dude. It's not just one person saying, make it so all uh, like Captain Picard or something. Instead, we because so much of this goes down to the decisions of one person, one very intelligent, very dangerous person, there's a lot of time spent trying to suss out the inner workings of his mind. And that's not to say this is not viable or valuable exploration, but it may be more productive to measure actions and measure his own statements, right? When people show you who they are, believe them. Uh, as tensions rose, Russia did something interesting. This is another playbook move that happens a lot in, in the, oh God, a lot throughout human history. Russia issued a list of demands that maybe not surprised, but definitely put Europe and NATO and the U.S. on their heels. They said, look, NATO has to not only stop its eastward expansion, they also have to deny membership to Ukraine. Again, never, ever, ever, not once let them in. And in addition, you got to roll back troop deployment in any countries that joined NATO after uh, 1997. So why this, this is kind of a poison pill? Well, it's all kind of in an effort to demonize Ukraine as well, right? Like to set the stage for, you know, a perceived legitimate invasion. I mean, again, the invasion is the wrong word. They certainly wouldn't use it, but intervention, right? The idea of like they're up to no good. Um, we are policing this part of the world and we are within our rights to go in there and do something about all of their horrible, you know, satanic rituals they're performing. I mean, I'm joking, but like also, you know, it's that level of like uh, panicky kind of um, demonizing. And just so you have an understanding of the strategic placement of some of the some of these countries that Russia is speaking of countries that have joined NATO since 1997. Here's just a short list here. Uh especially ones that are in Europe, where you can imagine perhaps the strategic disadvantage that Russia feels by having NATO countries so close to the, to Russia. The Czech Republic, Hungary, Poland, Estonia, Bulgaria, Lithuania, Romania, uh, Slovakia, Slovenia, Albania, Croatia. <laughs> I mean, really, like if you... Uh, North Macedonia, Montenegro, it, they're all countries that are right in that space that Russia is interested in. Yeah, exactly. So the, the NATO expansion is real. No one's making that part up. But if you look again at this list of demands, the reason I'm calling it a poison pill is because for some observers, this was like, a broken record, or for some, it was wildly ambitious, especially adding that um, troop rollback right? Get us out of missile range. Uh, but this is also quite possibly an old strategy that's existed in wartime conflicts before, which is, it, it, here's the calculation. You ask for stuff that you know nobody is going to say yes to, and you know they're going to say no to it, because what you really want is not for them to do that. I mean, it'd be nice if they did, but everybody knows they're not going to. What you want is to have a cause of spelly. You want to have now a rationalization to go to war. You want to be able to go on the international stage and say, hey, look, we tried diplomacy, right? And now we have to, uh, now we have to defend ourselves 
right now we have a reason to be we are we are being pushed into war now really we're not waging it uh it's a war of protection and also add to this from putin's statements if you read them and you can find them online easily if you read them he had repeatedly said has repeatedly said and will repeatedly say in the future probably that ukraine and russia are culturally one people a single whole is a phrase he used a couple times and interference from the west changed that reality he see he questions or not even questions he he does not believe that ukraine really exists as an independent country uh he sees the current government as illegitimate and he's called them aggressively nationalist he's called them fascist he's called them nazis uh he said they exist on land that is historically and rightfully russian he said they never had any stable traditions of real statehood uh and the condition for peaceful relations, I thought this was interesting, the conditions for peaceful relations between states, he says, on more than one occasion, is that they do not threaten the security of other states. And coming from him of all people, that might sound a little hypocritical, uh, but from the official Russian perspective, the government is defending areas that have become self-determined, independent areas uh, from Nazis and extremists in eastern Ukraine. Of course, maybe this is the time where we point out that if Ukraine was somehow a Nazi country, it would be highly unlikely that they elected their current president, Zelensky, who yes. himself he, is Jewish. <laughs> not only is he Jewish, I mean, his family, he had many family members that died in the Holocaust. I believe both of his parents fought in World War II against the Nazis. Um, he was also a very delightful stand-up comedian. Apparently there's a, a, a bit you can find online where he and uh, a partner play like a xylophone with their uh, their their little Australias. Mm, yeah. <laughs> oh, what? Uh, oh, okay. Uh, mm -hmm. All right. <laughs> talking about genitalia? Yeah. Well, uh, well, well, you could. He was a, he was a, he was a goofy like cat skills type stand up comedian, like the Russian equivalent of like kind of body cat skills. Gotcha. Humor. Now, not that that like, not that that like precludes someone from being you know uh, a racist or or a, a supremacist of some kind, but I just the, the guy seems all right. Yeah, I, I I don't know about that. I'm going to learn about that now because I have to. But uh, the the big change between the past two three leaders and Zelensky. It's night and day, right? Putin was able to give $15 billion to Ukraine for, you know, to really establish some, some advantage there or some goodwill within Ukraine. Just, I mean, really relatively a few years ago, even though it was, what, eight years ago or something. Um, and now to have the leader wanting outwardly to join NATO, I mean, you can, you can imagine that they're you can see why maybe there's even personal conflict there for Putin because he was on stage in Ukraine signing those documents to give him the bailout in 2014. Yeah. Again, this, um, you know, it, it's very difficult to truly know the inner workings and mechanisms of a person's mind, but I, you are spot on, right? There, there's a clear pattern of activity here. And let's be, let's be completely honest too. There are Definitely, inarguably, long-established Russian-speaking communities in Ukraine. There are cities like Odessa where the majority of people speak Russian. And that's not – the thing is that just because those people are culturally Russian or speak Russian, consider themselves Russian – that doesn't mean they also share the same revisionist view of history or yearn for the days of empire. That's a leap of logic. I always thought Odessa was in Russia. See, I mean, like, I think it's just the, the lack of in-depth understanding of the complex relationships between these two regions and the fact that there are these pockets, you know, of like ethnic Russians in Ukraine. I always assumed Odessa was Russia. Well, uh, so did Vladimir Putin. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, well, there we go. <laughs> so, uh, so <laughs> this is this is the thing. <laughs> this is the thing. Russians make a lot of claims about the status of Ukraine today, and at the most extreme, there's the complete denial of Ukrainian identity. Another view is that certain parts of Ukraine aren't 
really Ukrainian, not when you think about it, and are only a part of Ukraine due to an accident of history. And Crimea and the Donbass are the principal Russian examples, but then those claims extend further, places like uh, Kharkiv, Odessa, even Kiev itself. Aren't accidents of history just history? It's such an interesting way of. Uh, that's my about opinion. It. I put that's my opinion too. I, sh- I share your view on that. I, I put it that way because we, we got a setup. So, Russian nationalists oh, yeah. will even claim that there is cultural genocide being committed against Russians in the East, and that Russia is intervening, not to invade, but to protect Russians. Uh, did you catch that last one? You always have to be skeptical uh-huh. when any politician frames a conflict as a war of defense, especially if they appear to be the aggressor. You got to be cruel to be kind in the right measure, you know? It rings of preemptive strikes to me, but uh, all good. No doubt. It's a false flag situation. I mean, it's, 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 it's like drumming up, you know, the optics of a problem that you then are the only ones that could possibly solve. Uh, and it's it's like your pretense for going in. You know, and you, you guys nailed it because it is, in my mind, it is proven that under Putin, Russia did engage in false flag attacks. Check out the apartment bombings from a few years back. Anyhow, where's the evidence for this ethnic cleansing or this, this Nazification? Like, where, where's the evidence for this? Oh, You'd man. think if it was... Check out yeah. RT.com or check out whatever uh, Russian side... Propaganda sites are already, you know, are still up masquerading as news. It's uh, it's it's all over the airwaves there. Uh, you might just not see those clips on CNN. Did you also see on John Oliver where uh, some of the quote unquote proof of some of these things that he showed or that was being shown on Russian television were in fact explosions and, and uh, examples from like other things in other countries that weren't even very well disguised? <laughs> right. Yeah, exactly. Easily identified, especially by people familiar with that footage from earlier. It wasn't exactly uh, the best example of a deep fake or propaganda. But anyway, the main takeaway before we go to our next break is this. From the Russian perspective, Ukraine, uh, at the very least certain regions, but certain regions in particular, have always been Russia. In his mind, Putin is correcting an accident of history. And I keep using that phrase because I, I, I think we can all, you know, like, like you put it, Noel, I think we can all say that's just, that's history. It's not a multiverse timeline. The accident of history being the dissolution of the USSR? Uh, like that was unjust? Oh, he definitely believes that. But uh, more so, he believes the creation of the concept of modern Ukraine was uh, an accident by Bolsheviks, basically. We're going to pause for a word from our sponsor and answer one of the questions or attempt to answer one of the questions that I think has been on the mind of a lot of people uh, in the years leading up to this, which is why now? We've returned. So let's talk about timing. That's another question analysts are trying to answer. With all this long standing stuff in the mix, all this tension, all this enmity, all this dream of a resurrected empire for literally decades and decades, why did Putin wait until recent years to hone in on Ukraine? There are a couple of factors that come into play. First, the previous U.S. presidential administration was quite problematically pro Putin even when it ran against the interest of the people of the United States, which, you know, politics aside, that's not the job description when you're president. (laughs) I think that's safe to say. I don't think that's a hot take. And uh, the previous U.S. administration was instrumental in brokering some of the things that Russia wanted to see. Weakening of NATO via Brexit, uh, failure on the U.S. part to hold, help hold Russia accountable on previous agreements and so on and so on. And then secondly, and I wonder if this is being brought up more and more often, the global pandemic, COVID, may have delayed some of the actions here, may have delayed some of the actual deployment because like when the Biden presidency took office and uh, you know, Biden has been a, a, a long standing uh, vocal opponent and critic of the Putin government. What happened? It may have been it may have been just the harsh reality of a global pandemic. And that means in a weird way, COVID may have saved some lives or at the very least delayed some bloodshed, which is weird to think about. 
But a question that I've I've had and I've heard other you know folks on uh, pundits and, and the like uh, uh, posing is why didn't he do it under Trump? Because Trump was so cozy with him, and it seemed like it would have been optically a better move, and he probably wouldn't have imposed the same sanctions, or at the very least, not as severe. Like, why wait until you know a presidency? that is clearly vocally uh, in opposition to you, like you just said. Yeah, sometimes you got to get the chess pieces in the right place. And if they're not quite there, you don't, you know, make the move. <laughs> I, I don't know. That's the only thing. That's the only thing I can imagine because it does. It does. I like what you're saying here about COVID, Ben, because it does feel like as the, as President Zelensky comes in in 2019, you know, there's a window there between him, you know, getting into office and a move to be made, I feel like. I think it's U.S. presidency changing hands, and it's also Ukrainian presidency changing hands. Uh, you just look at those two timelines, how they overlap, and then where COVID fell in to just push it back to 2022. Mm. Oh, yeah, the peaceful passage of power. That's a really good point. Uh, and then third, for a variety of reasons, maybe most notably U.S. withdrawal from Afghanistan, Putin and his team may have decided that the U.S. was at a particularly weak point, which is true. The U.S. is uh, at a weaker point, or it was quite recently at a weaker point than it had been in the past few years for a number of reasons. So maybe this maybe this was part of the calculus. I think it almost certainly was. Also, note part of the domestic issues in the U.S. were created and escalated by active Russian cyber warfare. So he's well aware of that. Uh, when he recognized those Donbass republics as independent states, he tremendously escalated everything. And this turned into a full-scale invasion of Ukraine. That invasion is a brutal signal to the West that Russia is not going to accept any arming of or placing weaponry in Ukraine, Poland, Romania. There are other factors here that are, I would say, possible factors. Like, unfortunately, it's true if you are flagging and domestic support in a lot of countries, one of the quickest ways to jack up your domestic support is to in, is to have a war, just like that film Wag the Dog, you know, which uh, it's it's you need, some, a, need an enemy, right? You need like a common enemy. Well, let's right? let's talk right, about right. what happened with Putin's approval rating after the annexation of Crimea, according to the Guardian and several places, writing in 2015. His approval rating hit an all-time high of 87% in July of 2015 and uh, an all-time high of 89% in June of 2015 after the annexation in 2014. Are those numbers slanted, though? Like, I mean, is that coming from the average, you know, younger generation Russian? Or is well, this like, you can't I, just, I just wonder, where's this coming from? I, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> necessarily. But the same polling found that his approval rating was in the 60s just a few years prior to that in 2012, 2013. So like if it is a slanted poll, e even, you know, if you just think about it that way, it's up 30, 39 percent from a few years ago. What's that old joke? Uh, I, asked, I asked a Russian friend how things were going over there. He said he couldn't complain. Yeah, <laughs> that's uh, <laughs> ah, well, gallows humor. So there's also the idea you'll see conjectures regarding the mental state of the individual Vladimir Putin. Uh, again, conjectures about mental state can be difficult to prove, especially when we're talking about one of the most protected people on the planet. You know, it's not like, think about how difficult it is to get medical information about presidents We in the U.S. I mean, we talked about that in presidents and substance abuse, but it doesn't, unfortunately for a lot of media outlets, it doesn't particularly matter if you can, whether you can prove something about someone's mental state, it makes for a good headline. So your mission is accomplished. And that's sad to say. And, I'm, and of course, I say that with all due respect to the actual investigative journalists who are busting their asses doing amazing work here. It's not like there's some clause that can be triggered. Oh, well, oh, Putin's mental state is waning. There's something that's triggered by that that we can like oust him and replace him. That's just not in the cards. Yeah. You just now have a very, very powerful leader who is potentially, you know, dealing with a uh, depleted mental state and everything that goes along with that. No real checks, uh, no real checks on power, no real balances, no actionable thing like the 25th Amendment here in the U.S., which means that a president can be removed temporarily or permanently when they're unfit for office. But 
while there's a ton of reporting about expansionist would-be imperial Russia, and while those reports are true, people do believe that, this could also be an attempt to create, however violently, buffer states. And buffer states are another, like, I'm telling you, a lot of this stuff is not original. And things in geopolitics are rarely original, which we'll talk about more in the future. But uh, a buffer state works. From the Russian perspective, NATO expansion decreases Russian security because if you're a NATO country, the United States of America can build military bases on your land. That's a big no-no. I'm trying to think in terms of analogies like, okay, you live in a suburb, right? You're Russia. You're the biggest house on the block. And there's something like a, a really weird HOA that's coming into town, right? And they're saying you don't have to join, but they want everybody to join. And then your neighbor might join. And if your neighbor joins, that means they're going to invite their pal, Uncle Sam, the guy you f***ing hate most out of everybody in town. And he's going to be like hanging out there at barbecues, jumping on trampolines right next to your backyard. Uh, and the worry is that one day Sam might just stay. He might even eventually forget whose yard is whose. And that's why you have to think about buffer states. You have to think about things like the DPRK. There is, um, you know, North Korea, I mean, borders Russia, right? It borders China. Uh, and I don't think Russia or China in particular would like that peninsula reunited under a democratic South Korean led government. That's just inviting Uncle Sam to the backyard. So I, I know that's a fast and loose thing, but I think it works. Oh, it is. I do think the HOA is a very specific HOA of drummers. So like everybody coming in and joining up, they all become drummers. And then there's just people playing drums in houses all around you. It would be the worst, <laughs> um, <laughs> mm -hmm. says a drummer. I mean, having one drummer on the block is enough, <laughs> yeah. but like having like all of a sudden every house has a drummer and they're playing at the same time or at all hours, then, you know, you got yourself a problem and it might just start as a nuisance and then escalate into, you know, that's a slippery slope. And then all of a sudden the drum set set up in your living room and you, you can't do your zoom work calls anymore because of all the racket. Uh, yes. Oh, uh, but what I want to point out, just if you're reading the news right now, as we're recording this on March 2nd, you're probably hearing this next week, but there are signals coming out of mainstream media about actions China is taking and North Korea is taking and Belarus is taking and uh, all the NATO countries are taking. And it's feeling more and more like everybody is getting involved that you mentioned there. Ben. But for the most part in, in the anti Russia direction, I mean, I believe it was, you know, China abstained from from a, a, a vote um, in a couple other countries as well. Um, but they also haven't come out vocally in support of Russia, who I believe as recently as, you know, a few months ago. Um, no, it was more recent than that. I believe Putin was over there and said something to the effect of that the relationship or the friendship between China and Russia was like unshakable. It's evolving minute by minute. I'm reading a lot of stuff specifically about Taiwan right now. The, you know, that's a shaky situation but it appears to be evolving uh day by day nothing is nothing occurs in a vacuum everything in this sphere is precedent as well uh and and china is uh currently working on as we're recording some uh trade trade barriers with russia uh they want to of course china wants to maintain stability and grow its own global position but when we get to present and future concerns, there's much, 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 much more to explore here. It is right to say that the Russian Putin perspective leaves a lot to be desired in the way of factual support. It's not our opinion. It is demonstrably false that Ukraine is run by Nazis. It is also demonstrably false that Ukraine was never, quote unquote, its own country. The people voted to be so. And these facts add up to real world tragedy. As we're recording this week, just so you know, folks, the numbers stations went active, which is not a good sign. Putin also put nuclear weapons back on the table, uh, back on his enormous table. What are the number stations? Uh, it's a technology used for spycraft that originated in the Cold War days. It's basically codes that can be sent out over the radio. They can only be understood by people who have a key. And it's generally, I mean, it's used by a lot of different countries, this, this technique. But in this case, it's specific frequencies that Russia uses to communicate with actors who are abroad. 
who are not in Russia. It's like what happened in um, in uh, Doctor Strangelove when they're like trying to interpret the like codes on the plane that no one else can read, and it's telling them to either like deploy the nukes or back down. It'd be it'd be stuff to that level of uh, extremity. Possibly well, it's tough to know unless you unless you have that one time code. So we know they went active. We also know that economic warfare is in full swing against Russia. Uh, tune in on Friday. We're going to talk about that more in depth. Recent military actions indicate gross miscalculation on the parts of Russia. Their military is capable, yes, of destabilizing areas and of raising the cost of independence or non-compliance, but it does not at this point, seem capable of controlling a country that has nearly 40 million people in it, or even a city like Kiev, which has uh, like 2.8 million. And I want to add that I've been looking at, I usually don't do this, but I've been looking at stuff actively because we're talking about an ongoing event. It looks like just a few hours ago, the news hit that uh, someone leaked Someone leaked some documents from Russia's military that projected the war in Ukraine was meant to last 15 days. Uh, Ukraine got a hold of Russian military plans from the 810th Brigade of the Black Sea Fleet Marines. And Turkey also just denied Russian warships access through the Bosphorus. So is there not a bit of a sense that Putin sort of overplayed his hand and undercalculated a bit in terms of like how easy it was going to be to take over an entire country that he, you know, the, 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 uh, the force that he deployed isn't nearly enough to hold even the capital, let alone the entire country. Right. You have to ask about the stabilization versus occupation, which are two very, very, very different endeavors. But yeah, it, it seems that it indicates gross miscalculation on his part. But again, we are coming to you from a week in the past. We hope that this message finds you healthy, finds you sane and finds you safe. Uh, our thoughts go with the innocent people of Ukraine. And to be very, very clear, and I, I think we need to make this 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 distinction more often uh, in, in these conversations. We're not talking about the people in Russia, the people in Russia who are just as innocent and probably, you know, off, probably don't support a war. You know what I mean? Especially once the economic sanctions are in full effect. Uh, there are innocent people on both sides of every conflict. And that's not a middling equivocating statement. You know, I'm, I'm not going to pull out that old rant about elephants and grass again, but it is very, very much true. And you need to remember that uh, uh, we all need to remember that a nation's people are not necessarily the same as a nation's government and they don't have uh, the same control. While it might be convenient to lump a bunch of people into one monolithic group and say, ah, they're terrible. That is only convenient because it is inaccurate. Um, but at this point, we want to hear from you. We want to see what you, your take is on the context here, what your take is on the Russian perspective, what you think should be done, what you think will be done, um, what do you think will be the future of the people and the government of Ukraine. Can't wait to hear from you. We try to be easy to find online. Oh, yes. You can find us all over the Internet. We are on Facebook. We are on Twitter. We are on YouTube with the handle Conspiracy Stuff. You can find us on Instagram at Conspiracy Stuff Show. Oh, quick, uh, quick other new news thing that just came in, everybody. According to the New York Times, China asked very nicely that Russia not invade Ukraine until after the Olympics concluded. Isn't that nice? Okay. Uh, if you don't like social media, feel free to give us a phone call. Our number is 1-833-STDWYTK. When you do call, please make sure to give yourself a cool nickname and you have three minutes. Say whatever you'd like. In that three minutes, at some point, let us know if we can use your voice and name and message on the air. If you've got more to say than can fit in that three minutes, instead, why not send us a good old-fashioned email? We are... Conspiracy at iHeartRadio.com. Stuff They Don't Want You to Know is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows.